Okay, we're, uh, we're making really good progress here. Um, Kathy's been out gathering rocks for me this morning. That's worked out really well. So I have my two pillars done. And uh, this one's a solid structure, and that was relatively easy. This one's a little more complicated because around here, I had to put a, um, actually, using my m mediocre masonry skills, put a tunnel through there. So that's where the cone, if you would, of the bellows that I'm going to build. The double lung bellows are going to be out in that direction. The cone has to go through there to feed the air or oxygen into the bottom of the fire pit. So using uh, my ash clean out and shaker that Bo built me, which is going to work really well, this guy is going to get bolted on under here. So it gets bolted on right about like so. And, and my uh, nozzle, if you would, from the, from the um, bellows will come in from the other side. This is on, le reasonably level. It didn't turn out as perfect as I thought, but it's close enough. And now I'm on to the chimney, which is, <laughs> which is a little more complicated because I've got to build a, a tapered back to it. I'm going to put a small smoke sh uh, shelf on it. And then I'm going to put a smoke chamber on it, and then I'm going to reduce it down to 12 by 12 flues that will go out and extend above the highest point of the peak line. And so if you can visualize this, the fire is actually going to sit here out in the room, and the start of the chimney's here. And it's sort of, it's a shape that hopefully is going to cause a vortex inside the chimney and give me good draft so that I don't smoke myself out in here. Anyway, that's coming along, but I can't work on it today because it's so cold. So I'm going to go in and warm up by the fire. And I thought I'd talk a wee bit about history of the clothing of the time period because we've had uh, hundreds of people want to know what they wore, what the material was, what the fashion was. So I'm going to go in and warm up, have a coffee, and we'll talk about that. Oh my, that smells good. It smells good, Kathy. That is an outstanding cup of coffee that Kathy brewed this morning. So I'm going to talk a wee bit about the history of clothing and materials and patterns, if you would, fashion of the 17 and 1800s. And before I get into that, um, uh, the dress that Kathy was wearing this morning it was gifted to her by, uh, and I'll just use first names, and, and Kelly's her name. Oh, by the way, I like that name, Kelly. Um, <laughs> Uh, and she's out there in Oregon, and her friend Jean hand sewed this dress, and it, it's a work of art. So, if one looks at a thorough study, and my wee bits of history are anything but thorough, they are wee bits, um, a, a thorough study of clothing at the time, and there are people that have made a lifetime passion out of this, uh, it's pretty restricted because clothing items are perishable, and over time they rot. 
So our ancestors, when they became too, too uh, messed up, too worn out to either patch or mend, they were sewn into quilts. So a lot of the knowledge we have today of fabrics that were used in the 1700s and 1800s are from quilts that are two to three hundred years old or older. Uh, so from them we get an idea of the materials, we get an idea of, of the patterns that they, they had available in different time periods. Uh, there, there are some, of course there are some surviving ones, but a, a typical of the stories written about men versus women, sadly, uh, there's a lot more documented about men's clothing than women's clothing, believe it or not. Um, anyway, so so we have to um, we have to take take that into account that a lot of the stuff we we glean from from history comes from diaries and sketches, um, and and not actually from things that we can look at and photograph. They they are small in number. Hey, this is a tad funny because I just realized I said. I meant to say when their clothing got worn out, and I think I said when our ancestors got worn out, they got patched and stitched. So, yeah, uh, I'll make that correction. <laughs> and now we'll get on to the history of clothing. So, let's start with what um, uh, the natives were wearing, for example, when Europeans arrived. So, brain tanned hides. So, and that's a typical hunting shirt. And a hunting shirt had, wasn't open, it was a pullover. Uh, this would have four hides in it, one for each arm, one for the front, one for the back. And that would be typical. Now Europeans, um, and, and so that's hair off tan. And here's coyote pelts, so furs that were tanned were very commonly used. Europeans very quickly picked up on that. Um, and at the same time, the natives very quickly picked up on what Europeans were wearing. And I've mentioned this numerous times before, but if one looks at trade and the fur trade in North America, the single uh, largest item of interest to natives was fabric. Linen, uh, wool, um, and, and, and other types of bolts of fabric that, that they didn't have to go to the laborious effort of making brain tan or hair on. So probably over 50% or somewhere in that neighborhood, I've, I've heard different accounts, 50 to 60% of all trade was for fabric. And that's a fascinating thing. So. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about dyes, the natural dyes they use, and, and there's some comical stuff to that, or at least what I find fascinating stuff to the dyes. But before we get into that, let's talk about fashion. So the coat I'm wearing um, this morning, because it's colder, I got a jacket on, but this is called a hunting frock. So it was open at the front, and it was a wrap around, sort of like a house coat. They wore it with a sash, they could carry stuff down in here, but what I'm wearing is 100% American fashion. It starts um, the same time period as Daniel Boone's heading through the Cumberland Gap and, and that, that time period in, in history. And if we look at the um, General Br uh, Braddock's uh, failed campaign of 1755, both Daniel Boone, who's wearing this clothes, it was his favorite type of clothing, uh, and George Washington on that campaign. Before I get into the history, in the 1950s, I've really moved forward, there was a show called Daniel Boone, and in it, uh, well, I was fascinated by it as a child, but in it, Daniel Boone's always wearing a coonskin hat. Well, history will tell that, and there's first person accounts that Daniel Boone thought wearing fur on one's head was very uncouth. So, yeah, they took some stretches there with history in some of those programs, but it did get a lot of people interested in history, which is a good thing. Anyway, they're both wearing this. Well, George Washington's pretty impressed with this garment. He sees it as practical, cost-effective. Uh, and 20 years later, after the French and Indian Wars, we're now at the start of the American Revolution, George Washington is able to persuade the, um, of the Congress at the time, to Continental Congress, to adapt it as the first uniform of the first army in what would become a new country. So, yeah, very practically uniform. And he based it on the fact that um, they associated this jacket or hunting frock with marksmanship because it, the people that wore it were good. And, and he felt that that would instill uh, fear into the enemies, like the redcoats. Redcoats are using brown besses, they're, they're uh, smooth bore muskets. The, a lot of the Americans are using, as I point out to the marksmanship, they're using rifled flintlocks that are deadly accurate out to 200, even 300 yards in the right hands. So yeah, that's a wee bit of history about fashion, and it changed over time. So um, I'll just go through a few of these. So again, the 
the basic hunting shirt, just a pullover out of all kinds of material. That one's wool, wear that in the winter. Uh, it uh, also worn with a sash. That I get into dyes. I'll get back to dyes in a minute, but that would be indigo blue, which was a very popular color in the time period. But if we look how fashion changed, they wore a thing, we call it today a vest. Back then it was called a west coat or a west kit often. It was sleeveless, it was collarless, and it was the height of fashion. So that length of that one, that was made out of very coarse linen. The length of that one would indicate it would have been used in the American Revolution period. If we go back a little bit earlier time period, and you see how much longer this one is, this one would have been sort of early 1700s up, up to sort of 1750s or so when that fashion changed. And that's going to bring me to one of Britain's favorite colors and America's least. <laughs> this is scarlet red. And uh, I, I got to have a sip of coffee before I get into telling the story behind how red became the most expensive dye in the world. So true, true red or scarlet, if you would. Well, for, first of all, scarlet was actually a type of fabric hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And when dyed a red color, the two just became associated with one another. So scarlet that we know today, or red, uh, it, was, it was coveted. Um, for centuries it was coveted by em emperors, by kings, by aristocrats. But it was one of the hardest dyes to make. So the natural dyes that they had to use in these hundreds of years as they passed, they experimented with it, but they had used a madder root, uh, they used br Brazil wood, um, they used numerous types of fermented co uh, combinations of things like um, rancid olive oil, um, cow dung, uh, human blood or animal blood. Uh, and they were able to come up with different colors of sort of off reds, but never a true scarlet. But the real issue was um, that it wasn't color fast. The, the uh, Spanish conquistadors, they, they land in Mexico and they're blown away by two things, is all the riches they have, the gold and the silver, but more so by the, scolor, um, the, the scarlet colored clothing that the Mesoamerican natives are wearing and had been wearing apparently for over a thousand years. They discovered a parasitic insect known as a uh, cochineal, I believe. I, anyway, my, I, I may be t pronouncing that totally wrong, but it, it attacked the cackly or prickly cacti. And they found that by squeezing this little critter, that it produced this red blood uh, fluid. So what they would do is they'd dry them. Now it took approximately 70,000 of them to make one pound of powdered dye. Uh, but, but it, and, and I guess to, 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 uh, to take a little license here and get, get away from the dive for a minute, just think about history. And they think about how history is taught. So we know about the, the Spanish uh, conquistadors. We know that Pizarro lands and he builds a castle in what's now Lima, Peru. Those were dates we were taught. Those were dates that we had to memorize, we had to regurgitate in an exam, but nobody told us about some little insect that gave us scarlet dye. And, and that's where I think history could be taught so much better. So anyway, the, the Spanish are amazed with this stuff. They start taking it back. And, and get this, they take it back, not, not by just a boat or two load full of it, they take it back by the ton. In fact, they take back so much of this red dye that, that it becomes the second largest export out of Mexico at that time frame in, time frame in the 1500s, second only to silver. And, and it becomes sought after around the world by kings and dignitarians. And, um, so the color is used by, by kings and eventually uh, it's, it's used in the British officer's uniform. And you'll notice if, if, you, if you see a British officer's uniform, it's always that color of red. It's not the duller color that the infantrymen would be wearing because that was a much cheaper dye and it wasn't as color fast. But this dye actually over time, it actually makes its way back over the ocean and it's end up, it ends up being used in the dye on the red stripes on the embattled flag that flew over Fort McHenry and, and become the start or what we know as the American anthem, national anthem came out of that flag and, and the song that was written. Anyway, that's a wee bit of history about clothing. I could go on on other things. Um, actually, we will be doing a video. I'll talk about this just before we leave. 
So I'm wearing a pair of leggings here that are made by a friend named Lynn. I'll just say Lynn, and she, she, they're porcupine quills. Now these are, these are quite old, and they're getting quite frayed and wore out, but a lot of work, and Lynn's very good at it. But next week, we've got a friend coming, Dennis. He's coming from Quebec, and he's going to teach us how to hand weave um, using beads. So he made these uh, fine gaiters for me, or legging ties. And it's a, a, it's a lost art almost, and it's, it, there's no loom involved here. It's all done with the fingers and a couple of sticks. So he's coming for a weekend, and uh, we'll, we'll be videotaping that. And, and he'll probably correct me, but back to dye for a minute, I believe in order to get green, um, you need yellow, uh, yellow and blue, I believe, in order to get green. So I, I know that the the final color he used, or he uses natural materials, was goldenrod. Um, and that's where the yellow came from, I believe. Um, and the green, I'm not sure if it was the blue part, might have been indigo, but I'll get him to correct me when he comes. And uh, yeah, we're going to film that as a tutorial, and hopefully uh, we can get more people um, interested in, in what's quickly becoming a lost art, if you would. So it's, uh, it's warmed up. <laughs> in fact, I'm getting a little tropical in here. So I think I can start mix in some mortar and um, work on my chimney this afternoon. Okay, I've decided this afternoon I was going to go out and pour some mortar and work on that chimney, but I've got been procrastinating. I've got, uh, it's getting on and deer hunting's about to start and I've got a lot of root crops still in the ground that I've got to get out and into the root cellar. Uh, just before I leave clothing for a second, we think about our modern world and, and how we find certain th things inconvenient. Uh, take yourself back 300 years, and it wasn't a matter of you just simply had to sew this. You had to grow this. Uh, so this is linen, coarse linen. So you had to plant a seed in the ground. You had to nurture that seed. You had to harvest the plant. You had to dry the plant. You had to card the plant out. You had to spin it. You had to make the fabric. You had to weave the fabric. You had to find some natural dyes to dye the fabric, and then you sat down by a fire through the winter and you sewed it. So, yeah, if we think about inconveniences of today, eh, they're not all that bad. <laughs> they're not all that difficult. Uh, and, and the same with wool. So wool blankets, th they were woven, and you can imagine the effort it would take. But first of all, you had to have a sheep. You had to raise the, the lamb to a sheep. You had to shear the sheep. You had to spin the wool and card the wool out. You had to... Uh, <laughs> And then you had to weave it into a blanket before you could turn that into a, a capote or, or a hunting jacket. So, yeah, the times definitely have changed. Um, uh, anyway, I, I digress. I got, I got work to do. I got roots to dig. We've got uh, all the cabbage pulled out of the garden and back here. We, we just store them in the root cellar like you see them. We leave the roots attached so they don't dry out. Um, and when we store them, the roots can crisscross. We just don't let the heads touch each other. And we were eating this variety of cabbage, which slips my mind at the moment. We are still eating it in April of this year. So a great store. Half of it's going to go into sauerkraut, and that'll be in our crock later this afternoon. We still have to dig potatoes, rutabaga, parsnips, carrots, and beets. Uh, the potatoes we just store in bins in the root cellar so we can sort of keep an eye on them. Uh, the beets, carrots, parsnip, and, and um, rutabaga go into peat moss in, in baskets. We reuse the peat moss every year and uh, that's how we're going to store them. But you might have noticed as Kathy's pushing this uh, wheelbarrow, which we just made here a few weeks ago over here, it was squeaking a wee bit. 
Well, a wee bit of history. In, in World War II, the American uh, Air Force needed a, a, a landing strip that was close enough to Japan that they wouldn't have to refuel somewhere. So they employed tens of thousands of Japanese, or Chinese, I should say, to build this runway. And they all brought their wheelbarrows. A wheelbarrow was invented in China back in the 400, something like that. Anyway, they bring their wheelbarrows, but the wheelbarrows all squeak. Well, it's driving the Corps of Engineers soldiers there absolutely insane. So the commanding officer, when, when the Chinese had all gone for lunch and had a break, he orders them to grease the, grease the axles of these wheelbarrows. They come back from their lunch, pick up their wheelbarrows. Well, wheels, they don't squeak anymore. Come to find out, so they put the wheelbarrows down and they walk off the job site. Well, the Americans come to find out that the Chinese believe that that squeak kept away evil spirits. So the Chinese aren't gonna have any part of it. So he orders the same soldiers to go back out and degrease the axles. And as soon as they were squeaking again and the Chinese laborers were happy, they picked up their wheelbarrows and went back to building the airstrip. Anyway, I digress. I got a lot of work to do over here in the garden. Right, I best put these away first. Oh yeah, I should mention, I can't, the fellow's name slips my mind, but that was that was a comment sent into our into our channel in the comment section. And uh, and I, I keep them coming because I, I love hearing these stories. It actually makes my day. Yeah, it breaks up the tedium of, of filling the root cellar.